All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today. We're going to have a live discussion of the customer support funnel. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm the customer evangelist here at HelpScout, and we make fantastic customer support tools to help you grow your business. And with me today are two fantastic co-hosts. Uh, the first is Molly Wojcik, and she's from Snap Engage. Hello, Molly. And Heidi from Farm Logs. Hello, Heidi. Can I ask you to introduce yourselves? Technical problem there. Oh, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yes, go for it. OK. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I am Molly Wojcik. Um, I am the marketing manager at Snap Engage. Uh, Snap Engage is a live chat software platform for sales and support teams. And we, our technology provides um, tools to help businesses engage and support their website visitors in real time. Fantastic. And Heidi? Hi, everyone. My name is Heidi Kahn, and I'm the VP of Customer Success at a software startup called Farmlogs. Farmlogs creates remote sensing software that allows farmers to increase their crop production while decreasing their expenses. Fantastic. So for the next half an hour or so, we're going to be talking about the customer support funnel. Uh, what is it? What does it mean? Why does it matter? How it might apply to your businesses and how it applies to ours? And then at the end of that discussion, we're going to uh, answer some audience questions. So if you have a question at any point in the next half hour, just jump onto Twitter, tweet at HelpScout, uh, use the hashtag support funnel, and ask your question there. And that will help us find it. And then we'll answer those all at the end. So that's tweet at HelpScout, hashtag support funnel. All right, so let's get started. <clears throat> You've probably all heard about the, the marketing funnel. It's a really common business tool to describe the different stages of uh, that a potential customer goes through until they become a customer. And it's a funnel because it's uh, got a lot of people that go in at the top. And then as you go further down through the stages, some people drop out of that process, and not all of them become customers. So now I don't know how you feel about uh, the idea of the marketing funnel and a sales funnel. I mean, it's got fun right at the start, so that's a good start. but. Not everybody uses the marketing funnel in a kind of customer-centric way. And I think we, in certainly in the customer service world, we have a, sometimes a little bit of a reaction to the idea of kind of forcing people through a funnel, and it feels a little bit aggressive and not customer servicey, uh, like shoving them through a kind of a meat grinder and coming out at the bottom as customers. Uh, and I don't think, don't think that's what we want to do. <clears throat> and I, so I wanted to be clear up front that what we're talking about today is not about what we do to customers. It's not about forcing them through a, a process for our benefit. We're talking about a funnel to use it as a framework for thinking about the customer experience, thinking about how we can make that a better and, and a more consistent process for a, for a customer all the way through the, their first interactions with the business through to being a long-term, hopefully, a long-term customer. So what we're talking about today is not a series of of things that you need to do. It's just, here's a way that you can think about your business, and the way you apply it will differ to the way that we apply it at HelpScout and to the way Molly and Heidi apply it in their businesses. OK. So uh, Molly, recently you wrote an article for us on the HelpScout blog about the customer support funnel. So why don't you kick us off and, and just kind of give us the big picture of what is a customer support funnel? Sure. Um, well, the support funnel, um, the way we vision it, um, you, you know, you talked a little bit about the shape of it. And um, to us, um, that inverted shape is really um, looking at the customer touch points. Um, and so from as they come out of that sales stage, um, there's still very much a lot of one to one communication. Um, and that generally will get broader as they move down through the support funnel. So customers um, will start having community discussions with other customers. Um, so you'll, you'll see that's how we um, envision the inverted funnel, um, as we like to call it. Um, but Essentially, it's uh, it's intended to be a framework um, to help evaluate where our customers are in their life cycle. Um, so from that sales stage into the onboarding process, 
um, through you know the post sale support and retention and advocacy stages um, because we all know that the customer journey doesn't end at the sale um, so for us identifying um, those stages helps us better plan um, support resources so we can be proactive um, with our customer support um, and also um, uh, providing them with the resources they need at each of those stages. Fantastic. Let me just bring up the funnel for everybody here. So this is this is the funnel that we're talking about. And you can find this and the, the full description on the Help Scout blog where you can read Molly's whole article. So what we're going to do today is kind of talk through the, the different stages, uh, talk about what they mean, uh, how you might identify a customer in that stage, and, and what you might do about it if there's a gap there. Um, so let me bring that back off. But Heidi, at uh, farm logs, do you, do you talk about funnels? Are they literal funnels when it comes to farms? <laughs> well, we do talk about marketing funnels, but we haven't historically talked about the customer funnel in the past, despite the fact that we do follow these same principles and think about the customer journey in these uh, specific stages. So I was really excited to read Molly's article because it does provide a great framework for adding structure to our thinking and our conversations, as especially as we work collaboratively across the organization to create our customer experiences. Excellent. So I want to talk about an, ex an experience that I had. This is a long time ago, many jobs ago too. I was uh, working for a software company in my very first job. And I went on a sales call. I was like the, the technical support to this sales call. Uh, and we went across Sydney Harbour over to North Sydney um, to try and sell this terrible software, frankly, that we were trying to sell. <clears throat> and um, I just sat in on the sales call. I really had nothing to do there. But uh, I listened to the salesperson just blatantly sell features that we did not have and I knew we didn't have. Uh, and I didn't say anything and I was young and foolish at the time. And so just kind of went back feeling weird about it. And then, of course, that customer, when they started, they signed up, paid us the money, and they started using it and found out that they couldn't do the things that they had already been promised. It was just, it was a terrible experience for them. It's a bad experience for the poor support people that got stuck having to look after that customer. Uh, and you, you know that that customer is not going to be retained in all likelihood. So most businesses, hopefully, are not quite as uh, direct about misleading their customers in that way. Uh, but as we move through this funnel, I think this is a great opportunity to think about what is the customer's experience and how are they how are they feeling and what are they what are the information that they have as they go through. So let's start at the top of the funnel. So we've just come through sales in the marketing funnel. We've made the sale. We have a customer now. Uh, we're into onboarding. Uh, Molly, what does the onboarding stage look like and what should we be thinking about it at that stage? I'm sorry, my, my computer froze up there for a sec. That's okay, we're talking about onboarding, the onboarding. The onboarding stage, yeah. <laughs> sure, um, so you know, in that um, story that you just told of your first sales experience, um, the onboarding stage is really all about delivering on those expectations that were promised in the sales process. Um, so for us, um, it's a lot of, um, you know, like I mentioned, those customer touch points, it's a lot of um, continued one-to-one -one communication. And it's also um, oftentimes where um, there, there will be a, a team lead or an operations person who is researching our software and actually going through the sales process. But in the end, it, it's their team that's using the software. So for us, it's bringing other members of their team on board and getting them to love the product just as much as the person who was in charge of the sale. So um, for us, uh, yeah, that's, that's what we do. And Heidi, you have customers who are probably from a, a different type of background than most software companies. What is, uh, do you see problems in onboarding? Like what happens if you don't onboard someone correctly? 
Um, for us, it's pretty drastic, and we learned some lessons along the way, of course, like everybody does. Uh, but farmers, as you might imagine, are very relationship-oriented and how they want to do business. And so um, for us, it's making sure that we have meaningful, really meaningful conversations up front. And similar to what Molly said, is making sure that we truly understand their business goals, because as you might imagine, all farms are very different. And... Um, making sure that their expectations were properly set by sales. And then the customer success team spends a lot of time really kind of walking the customer through, educating them on how to meet those goals and looping back to the expectation setting, making sure that everything is aligned and that we're really setting the customer up for long-term success. Absolutely. And I think an important point here is to just to, to think about what onboarding looks like, even within one company, it might be a very different experience for different types of customers, uh, especially like kind of in our SaaS world where some companies are going to have thousands and thousands of customers coming through. And you can't probably onboard those with a, an account manager or a bit of handholding or a personal interaction. And so you might need to find different ways of making sure that there's all those people coming in through the sales process understand uh, what the product does and conceptually how it works and have a good kind of mental model of the, the thing it is that they're using. Uh, are there particular tools that have worked for you, for either of you, or haven't worked and that you've had to change up in the onboarding process? Sure. So um, one gap um, actually in evaluating the funnel, um, particularly in the onboarding stage, one gap that we've identified recently is a lack of video um, that really is a kind of a hands-on walkthrough of our tool. And like I mentioned, um, a lot of what we do in the onboarding stage is getting other team members onboarded. Um, so whereas the person who was initially responsible for the sale may have gone through a demo um, with our um, dedicated sales manager, um, the rest of the team hasn't necessarily seen that. So it's um, developing those tools um, that we can provide them up front so that we're not, as you mentioned, having to onboard every single client as they come through. For us, we started with larger group webinars and we found out that they weren't very successful. A lot of customers didn't want to join them because they were one to many. And because we're only providing um, onboarding to our top tier paying customers, we decided to transition that a little bit and start doing screen shares. So now all of our top paying customers get one-on-one -on -one screen shares that are really customized to their goals and what they're growing and um, how they're running their operation, but then we supplement throughout the year with emails that contain video tutorials and support articles that are relevant to our customers given what they're growing and the time of the year uh, that they're in with their growing season. All right, let's move on to the next section. But before we do, I just think it's worth probably pointing out that uh, customers don't necessarily go through these stages in this order every time, right? And so as we go through, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, how they fit together and the fact that, you know, you, you might have a customer who's gone, been with you for some time who still hasn't really grasped something which is core to the, to the understanding of the system and, and really has kind of skipped onboarding, um, particularly if you think about a business who signs up and the, the person that you work with moves on and then there's another person who's now using the product as if they had been around for three years, but really just using the specific things that they know about and doesn't understand the system. So that's, we'll come back to that, but I just wanted to point out that uh, this is not a kind of a structured flow that everyone goes through in that order. But let's talk about support. So you've got your customer, you've onboarded them, uh, they've started using their product, and now they're kind of moving into that long-term day-to-day support interaction with the company, trying to get some help. Uh, Molly, what does that look like? And what should, we, uh, what should we be looking for to understand a customer who's at that stage? Sure. So. Um... As you mentioned, this is kind of going from the getting to know your product to how can I best leverage this product to really achieve the objectives that I've set out to achieve. Um, so for us, that um, is an ongoing process. Um, so um, as you mentioned, the, the life cycle stages in the support funnel aren't necessarily 
um, rigid and people aren't flowing um, from one to the other um, necessarily in a, a streamlined flow. Um, so this can be a prolonged uh, uh, ongoing support. Um, and so we do this primarily through live chat because that's our product um, and it's how uh, we best communicate with our clients and it also helps us empower our clients to use our tools better. Um, but one of the main areas um, and greatest benefits um, to what our product offers is all of the integrations um, with additional CRM and help desks. Um, so it's really guiding them through how to better leverage the technology um, beyond just our tools and into those other um, workflows that they're using. Excellent. Heidi, what does um, what does a support stage look like for a typical customer at FarmLogs? Uh, for us, they might uh, look at our support page. Uh, they might go from there and not find what they're looking for and end up reaching out to our team for help via phone, Twitter, Facebook, Google Play, email, uh, primarily email. We don't do uh, chat yet, although I'm going to have to look at Snap Engage. Uh, but yeah, reaching out to us and uh, expressing any kind of gaps between what our product is offering and what they're wanting to accomplish. And um, it's our team's job to try to fill in those gaps, either with permanent long term solutions in the product or short term solutions. Uh, with our support page documentation and it might be improving our onboarding training or sales conversations, marketing materials, things like that. How does the, uh, th I think that's a really good point that a, a lot of the improvements, it's not things that support can do better, it's that they need to feed that information to your product team who can change something. And what's that process look like? So for us, we use our uh, help desk tool to analyze what the common drivers of support are and we run reports on those on a weekly basis and look at the trending issues that come up either within the last week, the last four weeks. And we share that throughout the entire company. Uh, one of the goals there is to irritate people about the, the long-standing issues and use that to uh, help get those issues fixed. Um, but ultimately getting those things resolved, sharing all that information across the, the organization is really helpful, not only in just exposing the organization to customer pain, um, but in highlighting the, the biggest things that are holding us back from having a really great customer experience. Fantastic. I think at Help Scout, we have a really strong uh, direct customer support team uh, who are just fantastic at dealing with customers and helping them kind of find ways to use their product better and having quite, like, quite a broad role. Um, and I think that the thing that we found was uh, maybe some of the areas that we had to improve were kind of looked like they're problems in support, not because of the support people, but that's because where the, the problems come up in the support phase, I should say. Uh, and really because it's a failure in the onboarding process, like we haven't given those people the right information to understand how to use the product. And so there's generating support in the support phase because we haven't quite addressed um, conceptual issues or documentation or video um, or pointed people to the right resources earlier on. Um, so when you when you start looking at this customer experience and, it's a, and you can kind of, as a support manager, I have this problem too of like thinking this is a support problem to solve and not realizing this is where the customer support funnel comes in really handy. The gap is in the onboarding section. The gap is not in the support, but the outcome and the impact of that gap is felt in the support phase. Um, so this is, that's why I think this is a super useful tool for really digging into like, where is that problem starting and where do we need to address it? Okay. So how do you know, Molly, how do you know if your support is working? Um, well, for us, um, we look at customer satisfaction. Um, I mentioned that our primary source of communication is chat, um, and we have post-chat surveys that our support team reviews um, on a daily basis. Um, and when, um, anytime we receive a less than satisfactory rating, uh, we do make sure that we follow up with those clients. So it's we take it very seriously. Um, and uh, it's a way for us to continue to optimize our support experiences with our customers. When you're reporting, uh, this is a problem I, I've had in past lives as well. When um, 
both the negative feedback and positive feedback in support can kind of be unrelated to support the support person who's done their job. You know, they can do their job well and get a bad rating because it's it's really product feedback. And the other way around too, to be fair, is that you can get fantastic ratings and it's really just because they didn't have any problems because the product did the work that it was supposed to do. Um, do you, have either of you had any, uh, any attempts at kind of splitting out that feedback into things which are really about product, things which are about process, things which are about the actual support interaction? Um, yes and no for us. Um, from a measurement standpoint, um, we haven't, although that would be very interesting to do. Um, from a procedural standpoint, uh, we do um, we do separate those out um, through different systems. So all of our um, support tickets are tracked in Help Scout, of course. <laughs> and then we also have Jira on the product side um, where we are um, constantly tracking whether there are issues or customer requests um, and, and trying to better um, close those feedback loops with customers. So maybe we can't deliver on a customer request right away, um, but at least we're keeping them in the loop of where we stand on it. So we, we do put timelines um, on those customer requests so that we make sure that we're following up regularly. Great. Uh, Heidi, anything, uh, anything from your support team? Do they, do they have any way of kind of identifying this is something that we need to fix in support versus this is really not about the support experience itself. Yeah, so for the most part, I think we're very similar to uh, Molly and Snap Engage. Uh, we are primarily measuring our customer service satisfaction when we do that after a support interaction. Um, and we do try to make it very clear about the question that we're asking. We want to know about the support experience specifically in, in our message. Uh, but that said, we also go through and classify every single support ticket and run uh, reports on that to understand the exact type of issue. Was it really a support issue or was it a feature request or a bug or maybe a usability issue? And that helps us to understand what our major drivers are. Okay, that seems like one of those ones where yeah, if you're at the scale where you can do that, go through, that that work is probably paying off over the long period because you realize mm -hmm. that yeah, you identify problems that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Okay, so support, uh, support team, obviously it's a big chunk of customer's experience um, day to day, but at some point that customer has bought the product and you want them to buy it again, or they've signed up for a service and you want them to continue paying for that service. And so that's that's where we move into the retention phase. Uh, Molly, what does um, what does a retention phase look like at, at Snap Engage, and what is it? What does this stage generally mean in the funnel? Sure. So for us, um, retention is ongoing communication um, and regular touch points. We do, um, you know, obviously our our team can't support the depth of clients we have um, with one-to-one -one communications on a regular basis. So we do have different tiers, um, tier classifications of clients based on you know, their plan levels with our product. Um, and so we do um, regular customer success reviews um, with you know, our higher tier plans. Um, and then for um, our you know, more basic plans, um, business level plans, we will um, do our best to continue to optimize our self-service support materials. So, so that's a good question actually. Self-service materials, how do you know, um, how do you optimize them? What does that mean? So if we, um, if we find we're getting a lot of requests on the same topic, let's say um, people have a lot of requests about our Google Analytics integration, um, and we'll tend to see patterns of, um, you know, this keeps coming up. It, we know as a team we need to improve those support materials for our clients so that they, we can empower them to find the information they need more easily um, so that they don't have to come asking us every time. Uh, all right, uh, Heidi. Uh, retention in a in your situation is that like a once a year thing that you're trying to kind of 
make sure that a person's happy enough? Well, once a year we try to make sure that they renew, that's for sure. But <laughs> all throughout the year, uh, we're doing similar things to I think what Snap Engage is doing and having continuous check-ins, both through customer success management and account management. And for us, account management is kind of the go-between facilitator conversations between sales and uh, the customer experience department. Um, but what that actually means in in real life as it plays out is that customer success managers are checking in with our customers continually, making sure that they're set up to use features that are relevant to them based on the time of the year. And it also means from the account management side that they're checking in with our customers and making sure that our customizers our customers, our customers are recognizing the value that they're getting out of the features uh, based on the goals that they had uh, in signing up for FarmLogs in the first place. Yeah, so that's that um, trying to make retention a kind of full, full scale effort, like at, at all points during the year. And I think we always, we've all seen what happens if you, you deal with some companies where they really only care about retention at the point where you've already decided to leave. And that's just not a good experience for anybody. Um, the support team's role in retention is an interesting one. I think often a, a support team is the people who will see first those signs of possible problems. Like they'll notice those customers who are used to email every week and now don't email every week, or they'll see that first email come in, um, which is like, so if we wanted to export some of our data, how hard would that be? And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's easy for a support person who's busy and has a hundred other tickets to get to, to answer that question and move on. Uh, but I think an effective use of this kind of support funnel is to, to think, no, we can, we can train our support people to identify those things and uh, either you know, connect them with someone else who can who has more time to have that conversation or just to directly open up the conversation and ask them like yeah here is the answer to your question about exporting I can absolutely help you do that but i would love to know like what do you need to do with that data or how can we help you use that and understand it and that's just a way into talking about what what is the issue that's causing that the need um, but let's move on to our our uh, final section there advocacy now this is one this is one that's always fun. And I, I've told this story a couple of times now, but at uh, Subconf last time, I wasn't there, but a couple of our Help Scout team were there and came across one of our customers, Brittany, shout out to Brittany, she knows who she is, who was just really passionately explaining Help Scout to another potential customer and talking about how much she loved it and how much easier it had made her life. And uh, when you see that happening for real, and you realize, oh, advocacy is an actual thing. It's not just people who are on commission trying to sell to me, right? This is a person who's genuinely had a problem and had it solved by our product, and that's fantastic. So that's advocacy, I think, in short. Um, Molly, uh, what does advocacy look like for you, um, and how should we be thinking about it? Sure. Um, well, similarly, um, we had a similar experience recently. We just hosted our first user conference um, back in May of this year. Um, and it was a chance for us to bring um, customers together who are really passionate over, about our product. Um, and as a support team, it's really refreshing to hear that feedback because um, oftentimes you're only, um, not only, but um, the majority of your conversations can tend to take a negative tone or I want more tone. Um, and so to hear people really um, championing your product and your brand um, is, um, it's so reaffirming of what you're doing. Um, so uh, the user group, uh, or from that conference, we've developed a user group um, that where we um, uh, we use them for our beta testing. Um, so as we uh, work on and release new product features, um, they're kind of our first user test group. It makes them feel good. Um, it allows us to get the feedback that we need from them um, to better enhance um, the product uh, as we release those new features. Um, and it makes them feel like they have a voice in our product roadmap. Um, so it's a win-win for our customers and us. Yes, I, I think that's that's huge, right? That some, what makes somebody an advocate is, it's not just that you know, this product was useful to me. Um, 
I think, but there, that's that element of like, it was useful to me, but also this cost, this company actually values my contribution to their growth and to their success. Uh, and they do something about that, like that shows me, oh, they care about what I think here. Yeah. So Heidi, I assume you have some customer advocates, like how do you look after those people um, and how do you work with them? Sure. So we actually built a customer advisory team of some of our most engaged uh, customers who were contacting support a lot and showing that they were really excited about where our company was going and uh, our product and how we're meeting their needs. So we developed a team out of them and we run ideas by them, uh, you know, remotely have them help guide our marketing, other things like that. But we also found that the best way to build relationships with our customer base was to get FaceTime with them. So we bring that team together at least annually to our headquarters, uh, to our user conference, kind of like Snap Engage is doing. And even in their own communities, we go out and meet them and get groups together. Um, and that allows us to spend an entire day together. They can share their stories with each other. They share their stories with us. Um, we give them early insight into our product roadmap, get their feedback, and just further foster the idea um, that they're really invested and they're a part of farm logs. Uh, we're also piloting a community discussion board with them so that they can keep in contact with each other throughout the year. And our hope is that if that goes well, we can expand that to all of our customers. And at that point, our customer advisory team will be our brand evangelists within the community to the rest of our customers. Fantastic. I think there's a lot of crossover between advocates, the, the kind of things you do to kind of create advocates uh, and some of the things that will also end up increasing retention, which is like you say, involving those customers in the upcoming roadmap, even if you're not public about for everybody, but the targeting people who are really invested in the product and sharing a bit more information with them makes them feel more connected, but also more likely to be a longer term customer because they kind of know where they're going with you. Um, so let's talk about retention a little bit uh, and advocacy, that, that combination. Does this, in either of your companies, is this uh, something owned by the support side or by an accounts team or a success team? Or how does it look? Um, well, for us, um, we're a small team, so the lines between those roles tend to get a bit blurred. Um, you know, sometimes we, um, we're developing a customer success team, um, but it's still in its early stages. So they may not necessarily have the resources to um, jump in and help a client that's, you know, not on their list uh, of, you know, assigned clients. Um, so we, um, we try to empower our support team to act in that role of client success manager when they need to. And then um, we'll sometimes even get the original um, sales representative involved back um, in the process. Um, because they, you know, had that initial relationship with them. It makes the customer feel special that we've brought them back in. Um, and it's just, um, it's a better customer experience all around. That's a great point. I think something that we maybe we haven't made clear enough yet, this kind of support funnel, it can work for companies that are very small and companies that are very large, right? The, the way you apply it will be very different, obviously. Um, so I'm just going to bring it back on the screen for a second. So here's our funnel. I think if we, if we think about bringing it all together, so there's the four stages of the customer support funnel, and this diagram makes it look nice and clean and clear. Uh, and of course, reality refuses to be anywhere near as neat as that. Uh, and there's no hard edges to any of this. And when you look at a particular customer, they could be at multiple stages at the same time. They might be kind of circling around between onboarding and support, trying to understand what they're doing. Uh, you might have someone who goes all the way through to become an advocate who then leaves, uh, but you still got that same cost, cost company as a customer. Uh, and you kind of need to take them back through uh, onboarding again. Uh, and you kind of lost an advocate, but you have the opportunity to rebuild that. So, so this isn't a tool, I guess, for sorting people into buckets as much as it is uh, a way to kind of structure your thinking about how do our customers use our product over the long term? Um, how do I know? So Heidi, how do you, when you're talking to a customer or someone in your team's talking to a customer, um, 
what kind of signals do they use to understand where that customer is if we think about them in terms of this funnel? So I think uh, for us, if they're a really new customer and they're just getting educated on the product, like we would say that they're primarily in the onboarding phase for sure. Um, if they've been using our product for quite a while and they're running into issues, they understand how it's supposed to behave, but we might have a bug or something like that that's preventing uh, the product from meeting their expectations, uh, which were properly set, then like, they're definitely in the, in the support phase. But I would also say, like as you mentioned, it, it, the, the lines are very blurry. And like in those cases, we're as much working in retention mode as we are in support and always thinking about the next steps and making sure that we're prepared um, to uh, give them such a great experience that they're going to, you know, be in in retention and in advocacy mode as well. Um, and we're setting them up for those long term successes with our product. Yeah, and Molly, uh, I think you mentioned you've mentioned this to me at least uh, the process you go through to kind of identify where are the gaps that we have in our in our system and um, what should we be doing. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So um, we uh, we try to look again. At, this is a framework. So um, when we look at clients in our onboarding phase, um, we try to find uh, and really any phase of the funnel. Um, we try to identify commonalities where there may be. Um, Again, common questions coming up um, where our support documentation may be missing or lagging behind. Um, and so it's making sure that we have the proper feedback loops in place internally um, for reporting that um, from the support team through to the product te team and also to the sales team as well. So they are um, setting those expectations that we've talked about several times. Um, and so making sure everybody's on the same page um, but when we uh, look at each stage, um, it's looking at the touch points within each stage. Um, so whether people are communicating through chat or phone or email um, or self-service documentation and trying to fill in those gaps. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good model to think about. You can do that. Even if you're a very small team, you can identify, like, what can we do at our scale? What do we have, what do we have um, ability to do? So. I guess the, the big outcome is like the team, your company works so hard to get people in through the top part of that marketing funnel to get them to the point where they're customers and um, especially as, as a small team if like it's so much effort to get them that far uh, and I guess what we want to do is make sure we're not letting those customers kind of fall out the bottom of the marketing funnel into a pond of customers uh, and just let them to float around in there until they uh, until they leave. So even, even if you're doing fantastic frontline support, uh, there can still be gaps, like you, you might not see them. Um, so we want to, I guess, put forward the idea of using this customer support framework as a way to think about what might those gaps be, where could, our, where could we be kind of losing our customers or just not helping them as effectively as we can. Um, so let's move on. I think we've got a few questions that we can answer. And I'll just, uh, we'll just kind of run through those. If you've got a question still, if you're listening and you have a question, there's probably still time to quickly jump on and tweet at Help Scout with your question and uh, we'll try and get to that too. So, first question, who, who owns the support funnel? Like who's the person that should be in charge of that experience? Um, Heidi, do you want to start there? So I would say, most things probably need a primary owner, and at FarmLogs, that's me, because I oversee customer experience at, at FarmLogs, but I think everybody plays a role in that, and um, everybody needs to be ensuring that they're setting your customers up for long-term success, and so when you break things down and look at the different stages that, that Molly's broken down in her article, you can kind of figure out who is playing into each stage and uh, uh, maybe give those uh, different teams or different individuals key metrics that they should be monitoring on their side, um, whether that's uh, making sure that they're getting the right 
uh, like qualified leads into the funnel at the top so that they have a great experience when they come out the bottom. Um, anything like that or you know, improving usability uh, of the product, you know, maybe that's something that the designer UX team owns. Um, but I think everybody in the, in the company should have some ownership of the different pieces. Um, this is the customer's overall experience with the company. Molly, how about, how about you? Sure, I, I'm going to echo the same thoughts. Um, I don't think any one individual or team owns the entire support funnel. Um, different teams and individuals may own different uh, sections of each stage, um, different parts of that process, um, but there does need to be buy-in from the entire team so that everyone's on board and making sure that, um, you know, the, the sale is not lost at the sale and that we're working just as hard to get those customers to the advocacy stage as we did to get them that original sale. Yeah, I, th I think um, Heidi you might have mentioned this uh, earlier out the, before the call, but I think the one thing that the funnel does is provide a little bit of kind of business rigor and um, measurability to a part of the business that's often not really measured. Um, and that can help that can help kind of uh, make it more visible to other parts of the company so when you're talking about like there's ownership of in the design and UX side and there's ownership on this maybe on the sales side uh, having this kind of structure and being able to point to like you know what you consider this a customer support problem but it's actually more of a an issue that we're having with the product or it's an issue that we're having with mismatched expectations coming in through marketing um, having that structure laid out probably makes that a little bit easier. All right, uh, our second question. What do you think about the idea of retention teams? Heidi. Oh boy. Um, I haven't thought about this a whole lot, so I'm just gonna kind of wing this off the top of my head. I apologize in advance. Uh, I would say for me, um, I've never had a great experience going to a retention team um, when I've needed support um, because I wanted the company to care about me leading up to that point. And um, I think for us, what has worked for us at Farm Labs is focusing on retention at all different stages leading up to that point and making sure that we're setting folks up for success. And if at the end of the day somebody uh, wants to leave, we'll double check and make sure that we did everything that we could to retain that customer, but we're not gonna hold our customers hostage. We're gonna respect them as human beings and know that if they're parting ways, like there's probably a good reason for that. Uh, but we did everything that we could as a business to meet their expectations and hopefully exceed their expectations. Um, so I don't, I don't at this time see a place for retention teams uh, in, in our organization, uh, but I guess that's kind of my philosophy on it off the top of my head. Yeah, to me it feels like it's a, it's kind of a, a stopgap measure that's at the, it's right at the end um, when the, the problem has occurred so much earlier that you, sure you can probably save some of those customers, um, but you know, you're never gonna have the same impact that you would by going back and addressing the issues that are leading to people wanting to leave. Um, but I, I think in large companies it probably makes sense because the, the volumes are so high that uh, they can they can kind of get win back some of those customers and then get them back into the kind of customer support funnel and try and make it a better experience for them. But yeah, generally speaking, I think that's kind of a last ditch effort. Um, let's move on to, to another question. Do you have any tips, actually, this is a good one for you, Molly. Do you have any tips for really small teams who need to kind of handle lots of these phases all at once because there's only a few people? Um, sure. So like I mentioned, we are um, a relatively small team um, when you look at our customer base. So we support um, a lot of customers. Um, and like I said, we, we, don't, um, we don't place rigid lines around roles. Um, everyone plays their part and everyone has common buy-in that every touch point with the customer is an opportunity to improve um, their experience with our brand. And so as long as everyone is on the same page with that, um, I don't think um, 
you know, you need to necessarily assign stages to different departments and teams. Um, but as long as everybody has shared buy-in that the customer experience is um, first and foremost, um, and you have those proper feedback loops in place and consistency in those touch points, um, a team can work really well together, a small team can work really well together in um, addressing all customer concerns and um, getting them through that funnel. That's a good point. I, for me, so I, in a previous job, I was the support department to start with and then it grew over time. And I think the thing that I had to do was just constantly renegotiate with myself and then with my small team, like what can we do and what can't we do? And one of the benefits of being really small is that, yeah, you can you can just go above and beyond for a customer because it's such, it represents a small amount of effort compared to the win that you get, especially when you're trying to get as many customers as you can. Uh, and you have, you have a person, there's not many policies, there's probably nothing to stop you from just going, no, I'm just going to do it for you, even though we wouldn't usually do this for all our customers because we can't scale it up to hundreds of people. But for five people, if we can go and do a little bit extra and do that for them. So I think you have benefits of being really small in that you have a lot more flexibility. Um, but yeah, there are some things you just won't be able to do until you're a bigger company. And so as long as everyone's clear about that uh, and you're kind of like, yeah, we're, that's not something we can do for you, but this is what we can do. Um, I think you're successful. Okay, here's a question for Heidi. So any tips for relaying uh, user experience and pain points back to product teams and really initiating those feedback loops and, and strengthening it. How, how would you recommend someone set that up? So for us, we rely a lot on data. And I think we in support tend to be very um, like qualitative data driven. We hear comments a lot and we feel the pain of our users. We're typically pretty empathetic people. Um, but I think when it comes to throwing that information kind of over the fence to a product team or an engineering team, uh, those folks tend to be much more data driven. And so we've had to figure out ways uh, to kind of track those issues um, so that we can say, you know, 23% of our support requests last week were related to this usability issue. And, um, you know, we'll share that in reports that we send out every single week. Um, and then we kind of back up that data with the more qualitative data that we also have. So we'll, you know, include like a user story about it. Or if um, somebody was so upset about a usability issue that uh, it colored their customer satisfaction uh, rating, like the, they might say, oh, the support was amazing, but I'm, I'm so mad <laughs> about the experience that I'm having with your product that, you know, X, Y, and Z. We'll include that to kind of back up the data that we're, we're, um, we're seeing so that other folks are still feeling the user pain, um, but they can also make really sound business data-driven decisions like they would in any other part of the business. So it's a kind of a combination of the data and then putting a story around the data that helps people understand it. Okay. Um, Molly, I think you mentioned something about this to me already, but um, are there specific techniques for motivating those advocates that you've kind of generated to really go out and actually, you know, get other people on board? Like, how do you encourage them to do something directly helpful to you? Um, that's a little tricky. Um, you don't want to necessarily go ask somebody to be selling your brand. <laughs> so um, one thing that we're actually testing out right now is um, a sort of referral program um, with our sales team and, and also our customer success team. Um, we have a lot of clients who come in wanting um, to talk to somebody who's used our software for a while so they can, you know, even in similar um, verticals, so that they can gather firsthand experiences of how it's benefiting them. So we're trying to um, put together lists of clients who um, we have classified as advocates um, so that they can and, and actually reach out to them so that um, other we can put them in touch with other uh, clients who may be um, or other prospects who may be in our sales cycle um, and that helps them 
feel um, validated as a customer that we value their opinion enough to have them talk to one of our prospects. Um, and it helps our prospects um, connect with our clients as well. That's a great idea. Heidi, have you done anything in terms of helping advocates help you? Um, I would say we have in a couple of ways. Um, what we've done is kind of create meetups in, in areas where our customers who are you know, our big advocates, uh, where they live. And, you know, we'll, we went on a road show this summer and we like went on a tour and stopped at a bunch of our different customers' uh, businesses and um, held luncheons there. And they got to share information about how they run their business and how they use our our software, um, but it was also an opportunity for us to make more connections with folks in the community. And so they were really kind of doing the selling at those events, um, but then we were there to kind of piggyback on that and build relationships and, and um, come back and have a meaningful start to that relationship with them. Yeah, I wonder if the something you can do is um, just telling your advocates like what is the most useful thing that they could do? Because you, uh, we used to get this a lot, um, and I think we get this with Help Scout too, is people who are, who love Help Scout and want to be helpful and like I, I should tell everyone about it. And sometimes just having specific things that they can do you know, so that you can say like, you know what would be super helpful is if we could use you as a reference for other people in your industry. Like if you could, if you could give us permission to be able to say, hey, go and talk to this guy because he, he uses Help Scout and he's in your area. And gathering that permission that can be helpful or in other cases it might be we would love you to do a customer story with us so that we have something we can put on the website and share it so I think maybe the answer is often just making sure that you know what is actually going to be useful to you and so for the people who do want to help you give them something that's going to be effective yeah. because it's nice to have advocates and whatever they do is obviously fantastic but um, for the ones who actually genuinely want to help you giving them specific things to do that they will enjoy and that will be useful to you too is, is super powerful. Okay, let's see. I think we've got one more question here. Yes, um, Molly, you mentioned um, customer success reviews and I think uh, Heidi, your team do that too. What does that actually look like? Um, how is it structured? Um, so for us, um, it depends on the level of client they are and what plan level they are with us. Um, because again, we can't do, you know, quarterly success reviews with every single one of our clients. Um, so we, um, in those top tier um, categories, we have assigned client success managers who, um, depending um, where they fall, um, in that list, they may get quarterly reviews with their success manager, they may get annual reviews, um, so we kind of go through a classification system there um, with regular touch points. And then um, also within our tool, um, we have a tagging program where if a customer is logged into their account, we can automatically um, display a chat window that automatically connects them with their assigned account manager. So they're not having to be transferred through our system um, and having to explain um, what they're looking for to multiple people. Heidi, anything in terms of reviews for your customers? So the bulk of uh, the reviews that we do for our customers are actually happening in account management, which is a team that is separate from our customer success team. And we're very purposeful about that just because we don't want our customer uh, support or uh, our education team to be responsible for revenue. We want to solely exist uh, to help our customers be successful with our product. And account management actually lives under our sales organization. Um, that said, we do continually review how uh, how successful customers are with the education that we're providing them. And we give them opportunities to evaluate the, the training that they receive from the customer success team. Um, and additionally, I mentioned the trends that we see in customer support. If we have paying customers who are continually not understanding how to use certain features, that is really a reflection of customer success training. And we have to go back and realign customer expectations and, and figure out how uh, we can better set our customers up for success starting with training at the very beginning in the onboarding phase. Fantastic. All right. 
that's the end of our uh, of our chat there. Um, just final words from uh, from both of you, probably. Uh, would you encourage people to use a customer support funnel, and kind of how should they start? Um, yeah, absolutely. I would encourage everyone to use a support funnel, but as it relates to your business, um, every business is going to have a different application for it, depending on size or vertical, your types of customers, your product. Um, so. Um, don't use it as a rigid structure, I guess would be my advice. Um, rather use it as a framework um, for how you can better approach and uh, fill in gaps and transitions within your customer support uh, life cycle stages. Heidi? I'd really just echo what, what Molly said. I think uh, the most exciting part of the funnel for me is providing a framework for conversations um, across teams, especially. Um, and I think in terms of identifying gaps that you might start with, uh, I always start by looking at support tickets and, and figuring out um, where those gaps are coming from and then taking that back and kind of mapping it to the support funnel is a really great place, I think, to start if you wanted to get started on something like this. Fantastic. I think. Uh... I think this is a really useful tool for people to use. And again, if you want to read more about how it's applied, you can go back to the Help Scout blog uh, and read Molly's article on the customer support funnel there. I thank everybody for attending today and for listening in uh, and for asking questions. The recording of this talk it will be available and uh, we'll make that available to you. So if you want to share that with anybody or if you had someone that missed it, please come back and grab it there. Uh, thank you to Heidi and to Molly for their time and efforts here explaining uh, the customer support funnel with me. And uh, next month, Help Scout's going to be doing another webinar. We're going to be talking about switching help desks. So if you're interested in that, keep an eye on the Help Scout blog and uh, Twitter feed and emails, and we'll let you know about that one. And otherwise, have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.